So good morning and welcome to our final Forum of the Fall. My name is Ellen Clark King and I'm the Executive Pastor and Canon for Social Justice here at Grace. In January 1973, the Supreme Court confirmed women's right to choose abortion and so far the courts have upheld their, that ruling in subsequent cases. However, in response to Roe v. Wade, most states have enacted or tried to enact laws limiting or regulating abortion from requiring parental consent, putting in waiting periods, making people coming for abortion read certain literature or watch fetal ultrasounds, to requiring abortions to be performed in hospitals rather than in clinics, or barring the federal funding of abortions. And because of these restrictions, access to abortion has been severely eroded over the last 44 years. The number of trained abortion providers able to offer abortions has dropped, and some have also been scared out of this field of work by the abuse and the violence that um, many others have suffered. Women often have to travel long distances and face abuse and threat themselves when they go and try and get an abortion. So in the second part of our series on gender justice, we're here to consider the question, in this current political climate, what does the future hold for a woman's right to choose? And our guest today is the director of the documentary Trapped, which follows the struggles of clinic workers and lawyers who are on the front line of the battle to keep abortion clinics open and to keep the women who come to them safe. Trapped was an official selection at numerous film festivals, including SXSW and Sundance, where it won the Special Jury Award for Social Impact Filmmaking. Among Dawn's other projects are Gideon's Army, the Emmy and Independent Spirit Award-nominated film about public defenders in the Deep South, and Rise, The Promise of My Brother's Keeper. And later on this morning, we'll hear about her latest project, which is a Netflix series. So please join me in welcoming Dawn Porter. <laughs> Dawn, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having this conversation and for having me. I'm delighted to be here in your beautiful space. Yeah, welcome. And we're going to start by actually watching um, one of the uh, uh, trailers for the film Trapped to get a sense of some of the issues and stories that it brings up. So, this is the moment when we hope that all the technology works as it's supposed to. I got a pregnancy test, and I called my best friend, and I just cried, like, I'm pregnant. Be encouraged, be encouraged. Don't let it destroy you. 60% of the patients that I see are below poverty level. If abortion care collapses in Alabama because of the new legislation that's out there, it would be disastrous. In the past three years, there have been over 300 restrictions passed. Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, North Dakota, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Alabama, Mississippi. You have to be compliant with whatever they're asking us to do. You know, a lot of this doesn't make a lot of sense. How wide your halls are? How many bathrooms you have? The drugs always expire because we never use them. We're looking all total probably at $35,000 worth of work. Every time the legislature meets, there's another restriction. First, we had to have a transfer agreement with the hospital, so we got that. And then they passed the every doctor had to have admitting privileges, and that's the one that we just couldn't meet. We had to actually close down the practice entirely. Those new regulations that are set to reduce Texas to a state where there are only six clinics for the whole state, where there's one reproductive health clinic per every 2.2 million women in the state. It's increasingly becoming the case that women's constitutional rights are determined by their zip codes. There's really no clinics in West Texas anymore at all. If there's no clinic, if there's no doctor, it doesn't matter if abortion is legal or not. Like Roe v. Wade doesn't even matter anymore. We're seeing women self-induce with medications. We're seeing women actually consciously induce violence physically to try to induce a miscarriage. 
I remember getting a call from a patient. She said, I can't get to San Antonio. So what if I tell you what I have in my kitchen cabinet and you tell me what I could do? Prior to Roe v. Wade, women were willing to risk their lives to terminate a pregnancy. They're still willing to do that. Women have to have access to abortion. I'm Dr. Parker, one of two doctors who flies into Mississippi to provide abortion care for women. There are no doctors in Mississippi who provide care. As you know, it's a very hostile environment. My decision to go there was based on the fact that if nobody else will go, who's going to go? Today you see the first step in a movement, I believe, to do what we campaign on, to say we're going to try to end abortion in Mississippi. You might try to do so, but you should understand it's not going to happen without a fight. We are going to continue to stand up for women, you know, standing next to each other and fighting for what's right. It is not right that women should have to go to court to get the medical services that the Constitution guarantees them. In the United States right now, there are over three dozen cases on access to abortion services going through the courts. People don't realize, you know, we're going to continue to see these rights lost. Today it felt like somebody moved us back off the edge of a cliff. The Supreme Court is going to hear another one of these cases. It's going to be a showdown. Women should be in the streets on this. The pro-life side has won. We've already won. I just want more people to start asking who's benefiting from this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, give her peace, God. These and all blessings and blessings in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. As you can tell from the trailer, this is a very powerful piece of filmmaking. For those who haven't seen the film, which is available on Netflix, mm -hmm. what is it that you wanted it to do? What is mm -hmm. it that you would hope people would take away after seeing it? Um, you know, with, with all of my work, I think it's important to examine what's happening in uh, different places. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really... Um, so I was in Mississippi. I was working on a film called Spies of Mississippi, and it was about spies during the civil rights era that were funded by the state of Mississippi to stop the civil rights movement. And I read that there was one abortion clinic in, in the state of Mississippi, in the entire state. And I was really shocked by that. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, I'm pro-choice, and I, I think I'm politically aware, and I read the papers, and I hadn't heard about that. And I thought, well, if I haven't heard about that, and this is an issue I care about and mm -hmm. I follow, probably other people haven't heard about that either. Um, so, you know, I was just curious about how it could come to be that in a, in a country where it's legal to have this medical procedure, mm -hmm. clinics could be closing at such a rapid rate and we weren't hearing about it. So what I wanted people to understand is, I think most people think as long as Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, there will be access to abortion services. And that's just not the case mm -hmm. um, in probably half of the country. Um, there are um, many, many states with fewer than three clinics statewide. Wow. wow. Yeah. yeah. So there are five states that have one clinic in the entire state, including, I think, a state like South Dakota, which is an incredibly large state. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and then the second thing that struck me is the greatest um, impact and harm is being felt by poor women. And, um, you know, when we see the face of the abortion debate, um, we hear about young girls, they're often white girls, um, and it's, it's the abortion conversation is framed in such a way that it's this irresponsible person um, got herself in trouble, mm -hmm. rather than the very complicated situations that I saw over mm -hmm. the years of filming. So I wanted people to, um, you know, and, and I think we've seen in this year of politics, the people that are targeted first are low-income people with little voting or political power. Yeah. But then by the time you, you deny them services, where it starts to hurt when you get to metropolitan areas like Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, but by then, these laws are in place. And so, um, you know, I wanted people to, to be aware that this was happening and that this wasn't just a remote problem in one area of the country. 
You sort of talk to women in very sort of vulnerable and personal situations, yes. and they shared very deep stories and feelings with you. Yeah. How easy was it for you to, to talk with them? Um, so uh, I usually travel with, well, one thing is I, I, I choose my team very carefully. I don't, mm. I don't film myself and I don't edit. I don't do anything. <laughs> so um, I have to have really good people. Um, and I usually work with the same people who are very empathetic mm -hmm. and have this remarkable ability to kind of disappear. Um, so what we did is we would uh, get the permission, obviously, of the clinic, and then we would just have to wait, and we would ask people. So first, the first thing I, I would do is have the clinic owner explain mm -hmm. why we were there. Um, and then I would say, you know, I don't know if many people had not heard about the legal fights. They were not aware. They oh. just knew it was harder for them to make appointments. Sometimes mm -hmm. it would take three weeks to get an appointment. Well, if you discover you're pregnant, you don't, you're not going to discover it till six or seven weeks, right? If it takes you another three weeks, you're getting to, you know, you're getting out mm -hmm. of your, you're getting farther along and it's, it's a more difficult procedure. It can be more costly. It can be more dangerous. Um, so I would often be the first person telling them that their clinic was in danger of shutting down because the clinic wouldn't, you know, didn't want to scare the patients mm -hmm. and felt like it was their fault. So we would wait in the waiting room and after the speech, um, I would kind of look, anybody who looked me in the eye, <laughs> I would go and try and talk to them. Um, and oftentimes we got no's. This one time, this man, uh, during our whole thing, he was going, mm -hmm. he was there with his daughter and he was going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I was like, great, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna get a parent and a child. And so I went up to him and he's like, oh no, I just <laughs> think it's great what you're doing, but no, 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 <laughs> I'm not gonna talk. Um, but so there were a few women who, um, who did understand, you know, and uh, it was very important to me to not pressure anybody. Mm -hmm. So it was only people who I felt were really secure in their choice. We wouldn't even film their feet without permission. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a lot of these women had been victimized in other ways, and I wasn't going to add to that. So it was hard. Um, yeah. It took, you know, years of, like, yeah. waiting around in abortion clinics yeah. <laughs> for people to talk to me. The most effective thing was for the nurses to find people. Mm. Um, and one of the nurses uh, actually let me wait in the recovery room. But, you know, I was in the South, and it was, you know, people in gowns and things. So she said, well, you can wait, but my camera person, who was a man, cannot come back mm -hmm. there. I'm not a very good camera person. So, you know, I just kind of went with it. Um, and it, it took a while, but I think once people started talking, they really did want to talk about yeah. their situations. Yeah, yeah, and to yeah. have somebody listen to them. And to have somebody listen to them. Yeah. And that's part of the reason that I don't film myself usually, mm. because you want to look somebody in the eye and you want to have a conversation. And um, I don't want it to be behind this. Nobody likes to be talked to behind yeah. this. You want to yeah. have, um, you want to look somebody in the eye. And, and, you know, sometimes I cry and, you know, all kinds of, you really have deep experiences when you make these kinds of films. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's part of the joy and the heartbreak of it. And one of the sort of heartbreaking things watching the film is seeing the clinic struggle between what they had to do legally and they, what they wanted to do out of compassion and care for the women and girls coming to them. Absolutely. Um, there were, so the rules are, so for example, in Texas, um, you had to make your abortion clinic um, meet the same standards as a hospital. Well, if you've ever been to a gynecologist's office or a pediatric office, those offices do not look like your hospital ER emergency room. And that's what the state required them to do. So um, oxygen suction in the walls, hospital gurneys, large operating rooms, um, very few of the clinic owners could actually meet those requirements. And that's why, they, that's why the first round closed. Mm -hmm. um, the absolutely, there were so many tragic things, but the thing that made me just, just so angry was in some of these places, they're remote and there is no good medical care. And you'd have these beautiful operating facilities and medicines that they were required to order, you know, thousands of dollars of medicines that they would order because they were required to and throw away. 
And so at a time when people are not getting medical care, this beautiful operating facility, which by the way, cannot be used for anything else. Mm -hmm. If you use, uh, if you are any kind of medical provider, you cannot be in an abortion, a clinic that provides abortion services um, by law. Mm -hmm. So these were just sitting empty, dusty. They had to heat them, they had to cool them by regulation. Um, very expensive to operate. So a lot of these clinics were operating at a loss to try and stay mm -hmm. open. Um, and that's where the Supreme Court case challenge came in. But it was really maddening to see them struggling so mightily to stay open when so many people could use that incredible level of care. Yeah. It's like a level one trauma center being not used. And tell us about the story of the 13-year-old girl we were talking about, which was so just heartbreaking It was heartbreaking. Yeah. So um, one of the women I followed, I just, just loved her. Um, she was a 13-year-old girl, had come in. She had been raped. Um, she was not sexually active before. She didn't realize she was pregnant for a very long time. Um, at 13, you have irregular periods, mm. and she didn't realize it. So by the time she realized it, um, she had to go to a clinic that would have more medical facilities and capabilities than your average clinic. So before 12 weeks, any of the clinics that are open can usually perform the procedure. After 12, 12 to 19, some can, 19 and above, you really have to have very skilled, you have to have a skilled doctor, um, a clinic that does these, et cetera. Um, you also have to have, by law in Texas, um, a nurse, um, that is uh, skilled in anesthesia, an anesthesia nurse, even though she wasn't getting anesthesia for her procedure. Um, and there was no anesthesia nurse available. There was only one who would do it, and she wasn't available. Mm -hmm. And so they had to turn her away. And her only other option was to go to New Mexico and pay $5,000. Um, and you know, she's telling me this through tears, and she's saying she's, you know, she was raped and she has to now have a baby at 13 years old. Um, and there's nothing they can do because it's very difficult. When you have so few practitioners, it's very difficult to line up your whole team. You can't get a nurse. And, and then, then there, there are a handful of doctors in the entire state of Texas and the entire state of Mississippi and Alabama who perform abortions. So I don't know if any of you saw Dr. Willie Parker that's how I met him. He, mm -hmm. was, he was flying in from Chicago on his days off um, and holidays and performing abortions because the clinics had no physicians. So he would drive from these clinics in the South himself. Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, the kind of the state. So um, you know, we may get to this later, but so the Supreme Court decided, and we can talk about this, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the state of Texas has not given up. You know, so as soon as there was this change in administrations, hundreds of new laws have been um, passed by the state of Texas. And what happens is the laws can be challenged and most likely overturned, but you gotta go through the legal process, which is not fast. Mm -hmm. So in that time, so Texas, for example, um, as the clinic started uh, closing, saw a several hundred percentage of uh, maternal mortality mm -hmm. of people dying, women dying um, because these clinics are closing. So um, it's, it's still a very active battle, mm -hmm. um, far from over. There was a scary quote um, from, I think in Alabama where they were trying to bring in a new law to say that you couldn't have a clinic within 2,000 feet of a school. Of a school. Yes. And um, one of the people who promoted this bill the Reverend James Henderson, um, said that he wasn't surprised by the fact that it was turned down, but he also went on to say, we know that there are hurdles in the appeal process, but the longer it takes, the more likelihood there will be another Trump appointment or two, Henderson said. So I honestly believe with all my heart that ultimately within a year or two, this is going to get to the Supreme Court. It's going to be overturned by a conservative Supreme Court. I mean, the strategy of the, the anti-choice um, movement has been to 
slowly whittle away mm -hmm. at the rights in the states um, and to get to the Supreme Court where they hope to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. um, and this past decision um, was 5-3, uh, which, was, which was great. Mm -hmm. And it really did establish, reestablish the right to choose and establish that these sham laws are unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the law fees by some of these groups are paid by the foundation started by Roy Moore. Um, this is actually one of his pet issues. You may not have heard about this because there are so many other issues with, with uh, Mr. Moore. Um, but that has been a strategy for the longest time. Um, Reverend Henderson's wife is one of the organizers of the anti-choice protests. Mm. And the particular law that they are referring to a clinic opened before there was a school there, and then the school came in. So they said, oh, why don't we pass a law that says you can't be near a school? Um, and so the clinic, which had already spent a million dollars retrofitting itself to be open, now was having to, to answer this like, mm -hmm. new rest restriction. Um, and the, the basis was we shouldn't have, so, so it's, it's the ultimate irony. The basis of the lawsuit was it's distracting and, and bad for the children to see all these protests. Well, who's leading the protests? <laughs> the people who passed the law. So the clinic is a very, it's in a like a, you know, kind of like a strip mall place, very unassuming. Um, the people causing the trouble mm -hmm. were the extremists who would have bloody fetus uh, models, uh, would scream at the women. Um, there's also a really disturbing racial component to it. Mm -hmm. So most of the, not all, but most of the protesters are white and they would carry signs saying, um, you're committing black genocide, um, you're a traitor to your race. I had people scream at me, I'm a traitor to my race, you know, um, and uh, they love black babies, you know, until they're born, they yeah. love them. Um, and so, you know, but for the black women going through these protesters, I got to tell you, it is, a, first of all, it's frightening. Yeah. You know, like, I'm, yeah. I'm not a chicken, but I kind of am, I guess. Um, and so, you know, we would go through the back door. Um, and uh, it's frightening. People come right up into your face, and they stick a camera in your face. I had my address published. Um, I, ha I was on an anti-choice newsletter. Mm -hmm saying HBO filmmaker turns her distorted lens to um, the unborn. Um, they're not kidding, yeah. you know, and, and I'm just a filmmaker. I mean, the, what the doctors and the clinic workers go through every day, that's what I was really interested in is how yeah. do you sustain yourself? Um, because then when we get inside, you know, it was like up is down. Outside, the South is beautiful. I don't know how many how many of you have spent time in the South? It's beautiful. It's blue and green, and it just looks, you know, peaceful. And there's all this ugliness outside. And then you get inside these kind of nondescript clinic offices, and there was such warmth mm. and compassion and empathy and non-judgment. And I just thought, how, do, how are these people coming to work every day yeah. and um, providing this really... Empathetic. I, I cannot tell you how many people cry their way through the entire experience. Um, no one wakes up and says, oh, abortion today would be a really fun thing to do, let alone having, um, you mentioned the literature. In Mississippi, the doctors have to read a state-mandated literature that says abortion causes breast cancer, um, that it causes ultra-depression and breakdowns. Um, so you have sometimes very vulnerable people um, hearing this. And, you know, so now they're scared as well as emotionally distraught. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really terrible preying upon uh, women. Mm -hmm. And you see on sort of both sides of the um, conflict, people using their religious faith and saying that's what's motivating them. Right. Both those sort of working inside the clinics and those protesting outside the clinics. Right. What sort of, what view did you pick up of the sort of faith side of things? Yeah, you know, it was really interesting. Um, I chose Dr. Parker in part because he is very religious. Yeah. I mean, he did not 
practice abortion for the first 12 years of his career because of his faith. And then he saw women dying, um, women who were getting no medical care, and he thought, you know, I think Jesus wants me to provide medical care, and this is medical care. Um, and since then, he's not only performed abortions, but been an outspoken advocate for what does Christ's empathy require of me, mm-hmm. a non-judgmental um, medical ser- uh, service, service require of me. Um, and, you know, my own personal background, my, my great-grandfather was... Um, uh, a minister um, at Mother A.M.E. Zion Church. Um, my grandmother grew up in the parsonage. My mother went to, you know, th- we grew up. That's how we grew mm-hmm. up. Um, abortion is not discussed that much in the black community. Um, people may have them, but they mm-hmm. have them kind of quietly. And so um, this question of faith, um, I fully, so I fully respect people's faith judgments. I do not expect everyone it's a complicated, I think, a personal issue. And I do understand objections to abortion. I do understand mm-hmm. that. Um, at the same point, I don't understand in what scenario um, you would have you screaming at women, throwing blood on people, uh, shooting. Mm-hmm. You know, um, The clinics get anthrax threats, death threats. Uh, one of the clinic owners trained her daughter to look under the car for bombs um, as a four-year-old, and they made it a game. Let's look under the car today, make sure there's nothing there. They have security cameras in their homes. That does not strike me as God's purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so my personal feeling is that it a, it's a perversion of religion. Um, and inside, you know, so I'm from the North, and in the North, you know, I'll speak for myself. I'm from New York City. We got, faith is personal. You know, no one says to you, which is your church? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, your, that's your thing. Um, in the South, and I made several films in the South, um, you, you, during jury selection, when I was making Gideon's Army, mm-hmm. one of the jury questions was, what's your home church? And what's your church that you go to? And I was like, that wow. is personal. You can't ask somebody what they're... And they all were like, well, my home church is this, but we go to this, and my husband goes to... You know, um, it's just baked into your, your life, what your, your, your religion is. Um, and so in the South, there's a scene in the movie where um, one of the nurses, unasked, prays over mm-hmm. one of the patients. And I thought, this is so inappropriate. What if she doesn't believe... And the, the woman, like, physically relaxed, and she, she hugged her, and she was so grateful to have somebody say she wasn't a terrible sinner mm-hmm. who was never going to enjoy the love and grace of God. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I felt like both sides were quite adamant that theirs was the true expression of God's love. Mm-hmm. And, and I found that a really interesting... Um, you know, kind of interpretation on each side. Yeah, yeah. The first time I heard a confession as a woman priest um, was a woman in her 60s who had had an abortion many, many years before who had waited to have an ordained woman to tell it to because she felt it was something that even a male priest who should understand, should absolve, wouldn't necessarily be able to understand. Mm-hmm. So that sense of guilt, the sense for of women guilt goes is, really deep. is enormous. Yeah. Um, and some of the most, you know, they're all difficult. Um, each and every one. Somebody can tell you, oh, it doesn't bother me. It bothers them. Mm-hmm. There's always this little, you know, shame and uh, feeling of they've done something wrong. It's their fault. Um, one woman, I was in the recovery room. And she just cried. Uh, she had a two-year-old. She had just gotten off of welfare. She had gotten to this great job program. She was married. Both of them worked. And she said, I cannot feed this baby. I would love to have this second baby, but I cannot feed it. And I will have to quit this program. And she just sobbed. And they just held her and said, you know, I mean, I have two children. If I could not have had my second, you know, I don't know what I would do. And to watch this suffering and to see that 
as she walked in the door, she's called a baby killer and a murderer and a Jezebel and a wanton woman. And of course she was none of these things. And of course mm -hmm. it's inappropriate, and, you know. Um, but it was just heartbreaking to see mm -hmm. what people are going through. And one of the ironies in the news at the moment is that those who are most against abortion are also cutting back on financial help for adoption. Right, yeah. right. Um, and cutting Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just kind of any... My sister works for a dental clinic um, in, outside of Washington, D.C., and there are no Medicaid doctors that will provide dental care for children. And they've just been cut off. Um, so these kids will come to them, and sometimes they've never seen a doctor. Like the dentist is the first doctor they've seen, and they're four. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the, it's the same forces that are mm -hmm. cutting this. It, it's, it's nonsensical. Yeah. We did mention Roy Moore, who mm -hmm. features briefly in the film talking about dignity. Um, do you think there's any connection between anti-abortion views and the sexual harassment of women generally and the acceptance of that? Um, what I've heard is, and uh, we got like this on flood, <laughs> onslaught of comments about this, is that um, Moore's uh, group and a number, I, I hate to generalize, um, so, so please don't take it as a generalization, but many, 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 many women and, and people have said the evangelicals have hidden the sex harassers, sex mm -hmm. abusers, um, and are just interested in regulating women's behavior. They mm -hmm. want them to not work, right. to um, have sex for procreation, apparently, um, and yet there is this, um, the male elders can do no wrong, mm -hmm. and so the wagons will circle, um, which, it just seems to me to be such a terrible betrayal, yeah. um, you know, of faith, and aren't you supposed to protect people um, and speak up about wrong mm -hmm. when you see it, rather than close your eyes to abuse? So I do think that there is, um, you know, and I think we saw it during Hillary Clinton's campaign, there is um, a fairly systematic attempt to silence women and to um, disempower them. Mm -hmm. And I think it is up to everybody, male, female, um, however you identify, to redouble your efforts to see what is there in plain sight and to not be polite. <laughs> yes. um, because that politeness can endanger somebody. Yeah. So, um, so I do think that there is a connection um, between kind of this effort to control it, it, yeah. I think it comes from the same motivation. Yeah. In your career, you started out as an attorney yeah. and then became a filmmaker. Did you feel that, that filmmaking gave you a chance to make more of an impact on these issues? Or? You know, I did. So I, I went to law school. Um, I was very polite. <laughs> and um, I worked for a firm for five years. And my firm was fine. It was not, you know this terrible place. Um, ironically, I worked for a firm that was very Republican, so I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my mentor was a white male Republican person, and, um, uh, but really also a man of faith, and he really taught me so much about being independent. Um, he was respectful. He really guided my career um, in a way that gave me a lot of self-confidence, um, and I'm, you know, so one of the things I tell my children is it's so important not to label and judge people mm -hmm. because that was one of the most influential people in my life. And on paper, we would have nothing in common. Um, and, and then I went to ABC television. First I went to the legal department and then I went in-house and I was the director of news standards and practices, which as my husband said, oh, you watch TV for a living. <laughs> um, but what we did is the job was to say, not are we being legal, but are we being fair? You know, and so ingrained, I was at ABC for eight years, and ingrained in me was this, you should be fair, um, particularly if you don't agree with the other side. You give mm -hmm. them their best shot. You don't mock people. You don't, um, you know, kind of humiliate people. Um, 
And so that's really, so I did that for a while and I went to A&E television. And then I thought I wasn't seeing the kinds of stories that I wanted to be part of. Mm -hmm. um, I have two kids. You know, I was like, if I'm going to be away from my kids, I want to do something that I think is important. So um, I started with Gideon's Army. I met these public defenders and they were kids. They were 20, in their 20s, and they're responsible for somebody's life. Somebody could go away for life. And these kids were often unprepared and someone would hand them a file and hand them 200 other cases and say, go. And there was this great training program that sought to help them. Um, it gave them legal skills, but it also gave them support. Mm -hmm. And a, in a lot of these jobs, that's what you need. And I definitely found that with the abortion providers. Yeah. Um, when we were at Sundance, we had to hire security. Utah is an open carry state. Um, and so we needed, like, we had a number of good security and cars, bulletproof cars. And, um, you know, it was not like my first Sundance where we would have to go around the back and get, it was, it was kind of bizarre. Um, but we had these great security guys. And after a few days, um, you know, we wouldn't have a screening. And I said, what are you doing today? And he said, we're going to, um, the abortion provider said, we're going snowmobiling. I was like, you are? And they said, yeah, the security guys are taking us snowmobiling. <laughs> and so there's all these pictures of abortion providers in the snow for the first time, and they're happy, and they're, and I think um, they said, well, one thing that makes the antis really angry is us having fun. And we don't have a lot mm -hmm. of fun. Um, but I also saw they were finally in a place outside of their closed communities where more people supported them. Mm -hmm than where they were at home. And they, you know, one of the reasons I chose these characters is because they were homegrown Southern. They were from mm -hmm. Alabama, from Mississippi. These were not people coming in to tell, dictate to Mississippians. And, you know, I asked one of them, uh, why don't you just leave? You've done this for 25 years. Your daughter's grown up. You've really done a great job. Um, and she said, because I'm Southern too, mm -hmm. and I'm not leaving my ladies and I'm not letting them run out, run me out of town. And it reminded me of, you know, uh, kind of activists from the race movements. Um, it reminded me of Ida Wells. It, you know, just, I'm not going to be run out of town. I mean, and I do think there's a connection between these strong people saying, you know, everyone from Alabama does not believe this. Mm. Um, so. It feels like you've encountered some of the real heroes of... America with the public defenders and the, the clinic workers? I think so. You know, I learn a lot. And, um, you know, it's not easy to make these films. It's not easy to do this work. But uh, there's a lot of guilt you get as a filmmaker mm -hmm. that I'm just dropping in. Mm -hmm. And then I get to go home. And you have, you have a responsibility to... Um, think about what you're, because we get so close, you know, you've, I filmed this over three years. So you're kind of in and out of their lives mm -hmm. and you become friends and their guard is down. And then you have a responsibility to say, what am I, it's going to be all over, not only the country, but the world. I mean, Trap just showed in Dublin for the third time. Um, in Ireland, abortion is illegal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those, so those women are super brave for showing this, they made it their opening night film. Wow. <laughs> um, and I'm really proud of that. But you think, like, these people's images are now projected. And you cannot explain that to somebody who hasn't been in a film. I mean, when you get to a, f a, f a s festival that's as big as Sundance, there's, huge, there's cameras everywhere. There's press. You know, they, had, they took to it like ducks to water. Mm -hmm. They did a great job. But we had this, we had already been accepted to Sundance, um, and we'd shot the scene where Dr. Parker says he doesn't wear a vest, right? He doesn't wear a bulletproof vest. And um, then a few weeks, like a week after that, and we were done. We were done with the movie. Um, the Colorado Planned Parenthood killer killed all those people. And I was just in a panic because now I have my very visible doctor mm -hmm. saying he's doesn't wear a vest. And I called him up. One of the things I do is I don't show the film to the participants until it's done, until I can't make any more changes. Because I love them. Mm -hmm. And if they, want, if they were like, oh, I look fat or my hair looks weird, they'd want me to change that. Mm -hmm. Or something 
else. So um, I called him and I said, I have that scene where you say you don't wear a vest and I'm just, and he said, I don't hide. I, I'm not gonna live my life in hiding. Mm -hmm. And you put that scene in there and you tell people that I'm living my life. And I feel like I, I don't wanna die and I'm careful, but I can't, if they wanna shoot me, he's like, and then he said, you know, it still gets me, they shot Dr. Taylor in the head, in church. Mm. A vest wouldn't have saved him. And you know, that's kind of something he lives with every day. Um, and, you know, so we kept it in, and mercifully nothing's happened, but... <clears throat> One of the things he said on Wednesday at Calvary was, they can't chase you if you're not running. Right. So he's not going to allow himself to be chased. Right. Yeah. And tell us a bit about what you're working on at the moment. At the moment, um, so um, my last films were pretty much all... So I did a film about public defenders in the South, and... Um, uh, I did this short that I love um, called Swamp Nurse, and she's a nurse, and she drives deep in the heart of Texas, and she provides um, maternal care to teen mothers, brand new teen mothers, wow. and she stays with them for two weeks, for two years. Um, and so I spend a lot of time in the South, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times with these kind of I, I, people, I, I can't even express my admiration for them. Um, and so now I'm doing a series for Netflix, and it's about Bobby Kennedy um, and his political and moral evolution. Um, and we use uh, pretty much all archive to tell the story. There's all this beautiful footage on film, and you see him going from a Cold War kind of ruthless, you know, supporting his brother and getting JFK elected to a person who gets Martin Luther King out of jail. Um, when he was, Martin Luther King was sentenced to the uh, hard labor chain gang for sitting at a lunch counter. And it was Bobby Kennedy who called the judge who said, are you really going to sentence this, sentence this man to the chain gang um, because our eyes are on you. And the next day Martin Luther King got out of jail and it turned um, not only the civil rights movement but it turned the black community towards the Kennedys, mm -hmm. which would make a huge difference in our Kennedy. John F. Kennedy wins that election, and that is one of the turning points they, they feel that happened. So, um, but seeing him evolve, he um, has conversations with James Baldwin mm -hmm. um, and kind of radical black leaders. Uh, he becomes very close with Harry Belafonte. He breaks Cesar Chavez's fast. Um, he's the one who, wow. like the priest, offers. Uh, he was uh, very religious, very Catholic. Um, but he becomes this, and he's in this unique position, and he becomes this um, unequivocal champion of civil rights and equality. Mm. Um, and I just thought that was such a great story. Um, you don't hear that much about Bobby Kennedy, and he's such a charismatic person and his relationships um, evolved. And I thought, you know, in a time when we have lost faith in so many political leaders, um, <laughs> isn't it nice to see someone who lived his faith and his, uh, and his principles in, in a way, but you see him change. And mm -hmm. that's the point to me, is that leaders don't spring fully formed, but if they're willing to engage, um, they can change. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can make a difference. A strong leader makes a difference. He goes on a poverty tour of Mississippi. He invited Marion Wright. She wasn't Marion Wright Edelman, who's now head of the Children's Defense Fund. Um, he invited her to testify about child poverty in Mississippi, in hunger. She testifies, and then she says, why don't you come see for yourself? And he does. He's the only politician. There are two of them that go to Mississippi. And they see kids with distended bellies and people with no food at all. And he takes his tour, and he's really shaken. And he gets the Department of Agriculture to send food, like, like we send food to Africa. Mm -hmm. We had to send food to Mississippi. Um, and he does that. And he didn't give up doing that. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a fun, it was hard. Archive <laughs> is hard. But we found all this beautiful footage on film. And it's so rich, and he's so alive, and a lot of it hasn't been seen before. Um, so nice. I'm very excited about that. It's, it's nice to spread your wings a little bit. So it kind of tapped a different part of my 
filmmaking. Um, and this is going to be coming out on Netflix? It'll be on Netflix probably in April. Wonderful. Yes. So. And we have some time now for questions from the floor. So if you have a question, please write it down and give it to Rebecca and she'll bring it to me up here. Um, why do you think abortion is such a focus of the right when in other countries it doesn't seem to be yes. a major plank of policy? It's not. We are yeah. the only, um, you know, of the Western countries. They think we're bizarre. <coughs> <coughs> Germany, um, the Nordic countries, not only is abortion provided um, as routine medical care, which mm -hmm. it is, but... Um, there's just none of this uh, mm -hmm. discussion. So there's a really interesting history that I've, I've only recently become aware of. Um, the evangelicals couldn't care less about abortion um, uh, 20, 30 years ago. And then they were looking for an issue that would bring the community together. Um, and it was, it was kind of a, a political um, discussion. Mm -hmm. So they decided um, before that, there was no, you know, in, in the 80s, um, certainly in the 70s, there were, you know, Roe v. Wade happens in the 70s, but you don't see that evangelical kind of, you know, out there. And then um, they decided for political reasons that they could, they needed an issue and that people, they could rally their base around mm -hmm. and say, this is our issue. Um, and then it becomes um, this political point. So it actually wasn't this you know, um, this has always been mandated mm -hmm. by God situation. It was actually manufactured. Um, and then once it was manufactured, it was very popular. Um, so, uh, so there's a political history to it, which mm -hmm. I'm not completely versed in it yet. I've just kind of learned this, but there are scholars who are actually working on explaining that right now. Because it's really important to understand that. Um, it kind of demystifies this you know, we now think this has always been the case, but that's, that's, not, the, that's not the case at all. Yeah. And um, you come from New York, as you said, but you seem to be drawn very much to the South. What is yeah. it that draws you to the stories? There? Um, well, they've definitely revoked my passport to Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I met these, the public defenders, um, and um, so that was kind of my introduction. I hadn't mm -hmm. really been in the South at all. I'd never been to Alabama before. Um, you know, and I had a lot of stereotypes that I'm kind of ashamed of. You know, I was like, I'm going to get off the plane in Alabama and they're going to, you know, I'm going to be chased by the Klan or something, you know, stupid. Um, but I think that there are a lot of st stereotypes that Northerners have of Southerners that are so um, misinformed. And I, I just found it to be a beautiful place, to be a, a complex place. Um, I loved how open and welcoming so many people were. Um, and then, you know, their characters. Like, mm -hmm. you just... <laughs> we're, as filmmakers, especially with what I do, we're attracted to characters, big personalities. And there's a lot of big personalities <laughs> there. Um, and I'm really fascinated with how people navigate. Um, you could be a pro-choice liberal Democrat living in Alabama, going to church every Sunday, um, and doing all these things, you know, and, and they exist in the same body. And I wanted to, I was just really interested in that. You know, like if you live in Brooklyn, you know, you wear dark pants and you, you know, you have chai latte or whatever. And, um, <laughs> and they're, they're embracing all sides of them. They love being Southern and they love being, but they're, they're, they're smart and, forceful and powerful. And I just really love, ex I like nuanced stories. Yeah. Um, I was making Gideon's Army and we were filming in court. And um, the person I was uh, following, we'd gotten permission to film in court. And she, I came out and she said, you're not gonna wear that, are you? And I, I said, you know, like, I thought I looked kind of cute. And, um, but I had pants on. And she said, Don, you could not wear pants in court. Um, and so, you know, I had to wear a skirt and, and things like that, which is, you know, it's not, I'm like on the floor a lot or like crouching and doing stuff, but, you know, I wore a skirt when in Rome, you know, there's no mm -hmm. need to 
antagonize people already. I'm kind of a foreign creature. So um, that's interesting. Like, you know, she's like, mm -hmm. I love dressing like a lady. Um, you know, and this is a person who's like taking on the Alabama Supreme Court about the criminal justice rules. And I love that. I love that, you know, kind of, she's, she's a fully expressed person. Yeah. So. Another of our questions was, in regions like West Texas, where nurses aren't available to clinics, are some nurses choosing to absent themselves because they themselves are anti-choice? Um, I don't think it's as much anti-choice, actually, as fear. Mm -hmm. um, a number of people, uh, you know, the nurses in particular would say, you know, please don't film me. Um, my parish doesn't know that I work here. Um, there were people who would sneak to work and mm -hmm. provide the services. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, a light thing to do. Um, in Tex in uh, Louisiana, the contractor who was building the Planned Parenthood Clinic, um, the uh, anti-choice people wrote a letter to his daughter's school. She was attending Catholic school and said, did you know where your, your tuition money is coming from? This blood money of you know, and he was the contractor building the building, I mean, and had three daughters. So there's um, a lot of very real danger to yeah. people. And, and I have to say, I, you know, I a thousand percent could not blame them. I mean, I have two kids. It's one thing to put your own self in danger. It's another thing to say, my children are also in danger, which is, um, you know, and I know all of the um, providers think about that. They have, they move several times, yeah. you know, um, they have security cameras in their houses. They don't, you know, you can't, if you're on a school list, a PTA list, you can't be on the PTA list because you can't have your address public. Um, it's a real sacrifice yeah. that people are making. But I did not sense that there were, I, I think actually there would be, you know, more nurses if there wasn't that physical danger. Yeah. And I know we're getting some more questions, but I'm afraid looking at the time, we're going to have to begin to draw things to a close. Dawn, what would you like us to take away from this? What would you most like us to remember from today? I mean, I think um, right here in San Francisco, um, I, I'm not sure about this, but I believe there's only one clinic. The clinic in Berkeley shut down. Um, they couldn't, and they were seeing people from two hours away. It's very hard. You can support your clinics locally as well as far away. And they are often very, very happy to have you. Um, escorts are really welcome. Um, sometimes it's patient mm -hmm. services, so seeing, um, helping a patient after she's in recovery. Not all patients want to talk, but some people might. Um, you know, sometimes you can... You can just do volunteer hours. And um, so if you're interested in that, financial support is always welcome. Um, every clinic in America is uh, at some form of danger. The people who oppose um, abortion are not going to stop. They are introducing, you know, California, we are safe for now. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not difficult. So I would say um, do not be complacent and think about um, you know, people in other states who there are funds that provide transportation and um, uh, hotel for people who live in states who can't, who don't have any access right. to abortion. Um, and you can help that way. Um, and then I think, you know, think about how these movements are connected. Um, and um, seeing those connections and thinking about them is really important. So That's wonderful. And yeah. it's really good to have actually something practical mm -hmm. to do so it can feel like you're making a difference rather than just sitting and watching yes. this unfold. And certainly having seen Trapped, it made me want to, to respond in practical ways rather than just feeling the emotions of the film. Yes, and I, I do also think it's, it's so important for people of faith to enter this conversation um, and to not be, you know, people whisper abortion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and to, to help take away the stigma, um, you know, because that really helps women. So, 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to so, all of us. It's great. While well, this is our last forum of the full series, I would like to invite you on to come on Wednesday evening, December the 6th, to the last of our Gender Justice series, when Caroline Gunter, who's the planning manager at Cisco, and Ross Hudnall, the vice president of corporate affairs at Intel and president of the Intel Foundation, will be talking about women in the workplace and the struggles that women face in that particular environment. You're welcome. Uh, that will be here, yes. You're welcome, of course, to join us upstairs for the 11 o'clock service. And we do rely on donations to make the forum happen. So if you're able to give us one, that would be fantastic. And thank you again to Dawn. It's thank been you. such a pleasure. Yes, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me.